Um, these standards that are contained in international human rights treaties have two sides. On the one side, there's the rights of the, of the women journalists, their right to freedom of expression, their right to be free from uh, gender-based violence against women. And on the other side, there's an obligation uh, on the side of the state uh, to respect, protect and fulfill those rights. And those obligations contain an obligation to have the correct national systems in place to make sure that those human rights can be enforced in a national context. Globally speaking, you have two um, avenues of recourse uh, when suffering um, harassment online. There's the civil avenue and then there's the criminal justice system. Both the civil and the criminal justice system has its drawbacks. Uh, the civil system can be very expensive. Uh, it's not always possible to find a lawyer at, 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 at low cost. It can be very uh, time consuming. It can be emotionally draining. Being involved in a court case takes a lot of your time, your energy, um, emotion. You have to kind of relive the whole experience time and time again. And it can also be difficult if you feel that the system is not doing justice to your case. You might have an unsympathetic judge or one that doesn't quite understand the impact that the harassment has had on your life. Um, the criminal system can have um, a, its own complications. Um, there's not an obligation to prosecute in many criminal systems, so that's a discretionary uh, choice from the prosecutor. They might not decide that virtual threats uh, are serious enough to follow up with real-life uh, criminal prosecution. Uh, there can be a, a lack of understanding of exactly what the technological context is in which the threats take place. Police officers who don't understand what Twitter is, perhaps, um, who don't understand that threats that are issued there have a really direct impact on, on the target uh, as well. Um, there could be lack of resources that is uh, allocated to training people to understanding these things, uh, resources to do the proper investigation and follow-up, etc. Um, and then also, of course, there's the whole issue of, of, of victimization of the target, because you have to be a complainant in a criminal case. Uh, examples of uh, online threats, and I say quote-unquote online threats, because uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that the distinction between the, what we consider the virtual world and the real world um, is, is an artificial one. Uh, whatever happens in the online context, always has impact on what we consider the real world as well. Um, so examples of um, of targeting women journalists uh, by harassment online are posting sensitive information online, uh, people's personal phone numbers, uh, home addresses, social security numbers. Uh, it's issuing threats uh, that could be uh, threats of violence, um, violence of a sexual nature often in the case of women, uh, insults, which could be, again, racist insults, uh, sexist insults. Uh, there's also the idea of uh, trying to get people's social media accounts disabled. So by making false reports of abuse coming from an actual real account. Um, and then there's also all sorts of other yeah, consequences of publishing um, personal information. Uh, a practice that sounds pretty juvenile is uh, posting information online and saying like, gosh, what would happen if this person were to um, receive, I don't know, 20 packages from Amazon a day or uh, making a false um, uh, call to the police saying that there's a dangerous situation in a certain home. Uh, all of this will kind of add to the pressure uh, on the individual and have them feel uh, very threatened. It's difficult to formulate a good solution to what the role of online media platforms should be in these situations. Um, there are often calls for stronger regulation, for these organizations or these platforms to uh, take a stronger stance on, on regulating the content on their platforms. But a balance needs to be struck, uh, of course, with the right to freedom of expression. And it's a really interesting situation in which you have the right to freedom of expression of the people being threatened, so the women journalists being threatened, and the right to freedom of expression of the general users of the platform. The problem, the problem that you get when you um, ask a private party to, you know, basically take kind of law enforcement uh, into its own hands and, and regulate, 
is that there is an incentive to overregulate and to overcensure, and therefore the whole effect could backfire if you look at the right to freedom of expression at large. I think it's very important that the issue gets framed properly and that it consistently is framed properly uh, as not only an issue that um, concerns journalists, not only as an issue that, consists, that concerns women, but women journalists and at exactly that intersection. So you have the standards of the ICCPR, you have the standards of CEDAW, and those two come together here. Um, there is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, a tendency, not only in this area, but in human rights law in general, to kind of think that issues are niche the moment that it concerns uh, gender issues. Um, I believe that uh, women make up half of the world's population, so that's a, a difficult argument to make in the first place. But also, women journalists are journalists, therefore attacks on women journalists are an attack on the press and therefore an attack on democracy as such.